it, it's an excellent opportunity to break away from the curriculum based model of school. Mm-hmm. And, and give, kids, give kids chance to just sort of free play, in a sense, academically. You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode number 263. Today, we're talking about how to handle remote learning with Stephen Green. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast, now with over a million downloads. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have, and when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama Mentor. I help smart, thoughtful parents stay calm so they can have strong, connected relationships with their children. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years, I'm the creator of Mindful Parenting, and I'm the author of Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. Welcome back to the Mindful Mama podcast, my friend. I'm so happy you're here. As I record this, I'm looking out my window at beautiful snow falling and that's mostly making me happy. <laughs> so whether wherever you are, whether you have snow or you don't have snow, I hope you're doing well. If you're new here, of course, a special welcome to you. This is going to be a great conversation. And it's so crazy because, you know, I thought that by February 2021, we would not have to talk about more about remote learning. But you know, so many of us are still struggling. You know, it's not easy. A lot of us are having a hard time with it. A lot of kids are going back, but a lot of kids aren't. So I wanted to bring in Stephen Green. He's an author and educator, founder of Making the Grade, a tutoring education company. And we're going to talk about how to make it better. How to make it better. We can get there. So I want you to listen for some important things, especially for little kids. This can be an excellent opportunity to break away from the curriculum-based model and give kids a chance to free play, in a sense, academically. We're going to talk about how, on the opposite end, high schoolers are actually at the most risk for falling behind and having a more long-term impact. So listen for the different ages that we talk about and how we as parents should be advocating for our our child's success. So we talk quite a bit about that. And I think you'll find a lot here to dive into, to learn. Before we dive in, I want to give a shout out to Enel Brack. Sorry if I mispronounce it for the five star review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so very much. And she said, or he said that Hunter is an authentic soul who acknowledges her mistakes and growth as a mother who makes her listeners feel comfortable enough to see our own truths and growths. She has incredible guests who add to the mindfulness revolution. I love it. Yes, the revolution. Thank you so much. That makes such a big impact to add those reviews there. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And now join me at the table as I talk to Stephen Green. All right, Steve, thank you so much for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast. Oh, Hunter, thank you for having me. Looking forward to our conversation and, uh, Happy, uh, what's today? Tuesday to everyone. So (laughs) listening, I don't know, but, uh, (laughs) well, it's interesting. The podcast does come out on Tuesdays. Uh, so it probably is a Tuesday for a lot of people, but hello to future (laughs) people. Hello. Um, (laughs) so I'm excited to talk to you specifically right now because of what's going on in the world of the crazy pandemic and stuff. So I'll just give you, you know, obviously we have, people have, kids who are all remote learning, kids who are going to school sometimes, some kids who are going into school all the time. In my own house, I have a um, fifth grader. She's going in four mornings a week, and my eighth grader has chosen chosen for the semester to be completely remote. And I know a lot of people who are, who are doing completely remote for safety reasons, And but it sucks. Like people are unhappy. <laughs> it was when, when I, my, I like your candor. When my uh, <laughs> ten-year-old was completely remote for between like Thanksgiving and Christmas, like, it's hard. Like she's missing a whole bunch of stuff. Like she just is like, and it, it's kind. Of, I feel like it's like kind of killing that spark, you know, like I I told you, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm really interested in Montessori because of like, I love, I want to keep that spark and love of learning alive. And I feel like remote learning is like killing the spark. So 
anyway, this is to introduce the whole topic of remote learning and like, what are, what, how can we, how can we do this better? And, and I know that's a hard question to answer because there's so many different styles and have things happening all around the country, but I'll let you start us off here, Steve. Well, let, let me, let me, let me start out by saying this. I think like anything in life, you're going to get a lot of perspectives on the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So what you expressed, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, I think is kind of a parent's perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Then you got a teacher's perspective, you've got sort of a school board perspective, you got a government level perspective, and it gets complicated. But I, I always look at it this way, education, first and foremost, should always be about the children, yes. the students. Because I was an educator, I was a teacher, I was a college instructor. I, it, the priority should be, are the children learning, A, and B, are they being taught in a way that works for them? Because many different styles of learning, many different styles of teaching, and so on and so on. So I, I think to some degree, y you could look at this from various viewpoints. But my observation is this. I think that the, the there had, has to be an acceptance that it's just not the same sitting at home in front of a computer as it is going into a school or any learning situation and expecting to get the same result exactly, right? So there's got to be compromises. And um, I could tell you lots of individual stories and I've counseled schools and I've counseled teachers on this, but that's the message I try to get out there is, is number one, the students have to understand what they're up against, which is a teacher that's a little bit compromised in the delivery ability. Because most teachers didn't become teachers to become virtual teachers. They like being in a room with kids and, and they like people and things like that. And a lot of teachers, frankly, aren't all that comfortable with technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can work computers in the classroom and I think that's improving collectively. Uh, but I, I don't think most teachers signed up to be basically sort of on camera personalities so to speak, trying to communicate to something. And, and then you got the subject uh, considerations, right? Not everybody loves math. <laughs> I mean, what about you growing up? If I was a math teacher. Sometimes it's very difficult to keep kids engaged in a math class because if they don't like it, they tend to shut down, they get bored, so on and so on. So this is just the normal academic challenges, right? Keeping kids engaged, having well-designed, objective-based instruction, that paces kids through things in a way that keeps them going, combination of activities and instruction, and so on and so on. And, and trying to do that remotely with everybody in different places is not easy. Um, but I think as we do it longer and longer, I think people get used to it. But that doesn't necessarily mean it gets better. And I could liken it to like, like a relationship, right? I know a lot of people that are married and are unhappy, but they get so used to being unhappy <laughs> that they consider it normal. <laughs> um, so they're not really trying to change it, but uh, I don't know if it's an apt example here, but I think what happens is you start to settle mm -hmm. for something that is suboptimal, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think as a parent, we send our kids to school and say, look, I hope you have a great day. I hope you have fun with your friends. I hope you learn a lot, come home excited. You know, we want them all to be, engaged and active learners. And I think that's where it's, it's tough. I mean, it's at a point now where a lot of schools aren't even talking about grades. Like they've just thrown grades out the window. It's like, well, it's hard to assess kids. It's hard to give tests. Kids aren't cheating on or whatever or being dishonest about. So that, that's kind of where it is. I mean, it's a little bit all over the map and I'll add one last thing to it, which is um, this all, at least where we live, really kind of came together. It was right around St. Patrick's Day. It was about March 15th. All of a sudden, it went from mostly normal to like shut down, bang. And the initial um, instructions were, we're going to shut down for a couple of weeks. This will clear out. We'll be back by April 15th. It happened to be the spring break for a lot of schools. It was right around then. Mm -hmm. So we went in through that. And then it was like, oh, we're going to go to the end of April. Oh, we're going to go to the end of May, June. I don't think anybody envisioned it going potentially through this entire school year and maybe oh, beyond. Yeah. So that is sort of a shock in of itself. There's so many layers here, I, I guess is what I'm trying to say that it's hard to really hone in only on one. Yeah, yeah. I tend to look at it from the perspective of the students, you know, are they getting the value that they need? So, so 
Yes. I think what you said, like, let's accept that it's not the same. We're not going to get the same outcomes. You know, we have to kind of get to this level of like, okay, like this kind of in some ways sort of in stepping back to where we were in March, where we were like, oh, this is going to be totally different. And we're accepting that Mm -hmm. our kids are not having this same experience right now. We're like, okay, fine. But then I guess the problem is, you know, so we understand there has to be some compromises, but I guess the problem is like, you know, it's like when we go in, as we go through so much time, like, I mean, I, my kids, at least like they're a little older, they can, they can follow the directions from their teacher at school. They don't need me there with them. Like, maybe we can take, maybe we can take this a little bit like age by age and think about like, what are some ways we can make it better? Like, yes, accepting that it's stinks. It's not as good and, and, and make it better kind of age by age. Cause sometimes I think about like, if you have a kindergartner, sometimes that to, in my mind, my idea is like, who cares? You know, like let them read, let them play, right? Like kindergarten is, should be very play-based, experiential-based anyway. It's not like super academic anyway. Mm -hmm. So, so then, so then that's great. So maybe if you kids five and under, you can, you, you know, it can just be kind of like life learning, but then what about, I think that, people start to feel worried and feel anxious when it's like, I had a kindergartner last year and then I'm have a child going into first grade. And this is like their first experience with school is like this age. So do you have any (laughs) suggestions or advice for, for people whose kids are like six and seven, like really young learners who are maybe just a little beyond that, just play and life base kind of learning and maybe starting to get into academic learning how can we how can we as parents support like parents six and seven year olds and then maybe we can kind of go up in the ages and think about that my opinion is that i think this is a good opportunity to take advantage of what interests the children Mm. Yeah. I agree with you about kindergarten. And, and I would even maybe go up to second or third grade. It's a lot of this is socialization. I mean, in a normal setting, yeah. a lot is learning to get along with other kids. A lot of this is learning to be structured in a setting, you know, where, you know, six hours, not natural for a kid to sit still. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I think from an intellectual stimulation standpoint, I think, I think you could take half the day, take two, three hours out of a four, six hour school day and say, look, let's do something project based. What interests you? Now, of course, I don't know how much a six-year-old is going to volunteer. Um, you know, I'm not going to say, well, I, I want to do a report on Mozart versus Beethoven. I mean, but but I think it's a good chance to break away from traditional curriculum. Mm-hmm. And instead of pigeonholing it and saying, well, you got to spend 45 minutes on math and 75 minutes on ILA or, you know, whatever, and, and this much on language and What's history, ILA? Uh, English. Language, language arts. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a whatever, teacher term. <laughs> teacher term. I've heard ELA, English language arts, but not yeah. ILA. ILA. Um, I forget what the I stands for anyway. Well, whatever. <laughs> language arts. I know it's language arts. <laughs> but okay, I mean, but- my point is, I think at that age, it, it's an excellent opportunity to break away from the curriculum-based model of school mm-hmm. and, and give, kids, give kids kids chance to just sort of free play, in a sense, academically. Now, here's the, here's the one beauty that I don't see people taking advantage of. And I, this, I'll jump ahead a little bit of the conversation okay. and say, we could do this at any grade level. Mm-hmm. One of the beauties of the whole internet cloud thing, assuming people have access to it and have strong enough signal, is it's very, very easy to collaborate. Mm-hmm. You know, you can take a room or a, a, a whatever they're in, teams, break kids up, have them do something as a group. Or people could do things individually. Like, it's very easy to share a, a file. And people okay. work collectively on a file. Uh, I was overseeing a pod. I don't know if pods were big where you were, but they were pretty big here. Um, and we did a project where uh, there were six kids mm-hmm. and they each got two pages of a, of, a, of a PowerPoint, a shareable PowerPoint. They had to do a project about energy. So each kid kind of did their own thing, and then, but collectively became this larger project. And I think you could do that at any grade level. But I think specifically for younger kids, A, I think you need to shorten the instructional time online. I don't think it's practical to expect a kid to sit there for an hour, hour and a half straight 
and, and remain engaged. It's just not normal. I think you shorten it. You do like 15 minutes on, 15 off or something like that. And in the 15 on screen, they would learn something. Then you give them something active to go do. Mm-hmm. So you say, all right, we're going to learn I don't know, how, how to write the letter A and B. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's a little, that's, that's about first grade. They start learning handwriting and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So you say, all right, now go, go take a little walk, go get a snack, whatever. And then come back. I want you to practice, do 10 A's and 10 B's. Let them do it on their own. Mm-hmm. And it, it models a little bit what would normally go on in the classroom. A teacher is not instructing and lecturing continually for six straight hours. Um, but, it, but it gets the kids used to that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And it, it gets them to have some pride in their work. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that's been missing is, is because one of the things that enables you to get buy-in from a student academically is when they take pride in what they're doing or they have a strong interest in what they're doing and they want to do more of it, or they want to start to expand on it on their own a little bit. Yeah. You want to take advantage of that, that natural interest. So this all requires like us as the parents or whether if they have, if they have some, some adult or a babysitter or whatever. Or an older sibling. Yeah. I mean, I guess you got to have that when you have younger I, I, kids. I think, to I think well, I think you'd have to this. anyway, because you yeah. can't leave a six-year-old at home no. alone. Yeah, you can't. I mean, just as a parent, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. So, but, but I think from an instructional standpoint, you're only going to get so much out of it at that level. I mean, there's only so much, the complexity of what you can teach is limited to some degree. But I think the key is to get the kids to have an interest in what they're doing mm-hmm. instead of just sort of robotically dealing with it, which, which happens at the older grades. Because at the older grades, it's like, well, we're learning this. We're learning about American history and the Civil War, whether you like it or not, and <laughs> too bad, or you know, whatever the curriculum is at that point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I so, think in another aspect of, let me add one last thing. Mm-hmm. Is yeah, yeah, please. Some of this, to a degree, and you hear a lot about this, and I don't think this is really what this conversation is about, but some of this, to a degree, is limited by technology. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, we're not, I don't, we don't need to get into the fact that, you know, inner city schools don't have as many computers as suburban, whatever. Um, but not every kid is as good at technology as others. So what I've been advocating in the schools that I'm working in is, is take a little bit of time, to just teach the kids the tech. Mm-hmm. It's, it, there's an assumption that just because a kid is a kid and maybe has a phone and it is way more precocious technologically than I might have been at that age for sure because it didn't exist <laughs> or my own kids would have been because it barely existed. Don't assume every kid is technologically savvy. Right? That's so true. My daughter didn't know that there were special assignments for three months. Well, like, that's what I'm saying. She didn't right, even right. know they existed. She didn't know how to log on to them and no one was following up to see if she Right. So I think, I think yeah. this is an opportunity to get out of the box a little bit and, and teach some things younger grade level, middle, whatever, that you wouldn't normally address because they're not needed in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Like in a class, you know, you know, you go in a classroom, there's always that like class rules, right? You got a big poster, raise your hand. Don't talk when other people are talking, uh, you know, put your pencils away, you know? Well, now you need virtual learning rules. I don't like using the word rules because it, it sort of implies a strictness, but you, you need guidelines. You need standards that everybody understands And I don't think that's ever really been formalized, at least in any teaching situation I've seen. Maybe some teachers do it individually. I I don't want to say none do, but I I think it gives an opportunity to make sure everybody's on the same page with that skill set. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. I am so excited to get back out into the world more. Oh my gosh, after this pandemic. And whether it's taking a walk around your neighborhood, running errands, or venturing out on your own, you always want to feel safe. And with Birdie, you can keep doing what you love with added peace of mind. Birdie is a personal safety alarm designed to be easy to carry and super simple to use. When you activate your Birdie with a quick pull, the alarm will emit a loud 130 decibel siren and flashing strobe light to help deter an attack. I would run away from that for sure. And unlike pepper spray and other deterrents, Birdie is no danger to you. You can feel confident to use it without worry. 
Birdie goes wherever you do. The alarm comes in multiple colors and has a brass keychain so you can attach it to your keys or your bag. It makes it super simple to have this peace of mind right there on you all the time. Over 300,000 Birdie alarms have been sold and they have thousands of five-star reviews. Join the flock for a safer tomorrow. And right now, She's Birdie is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase when you go to she'sbirdie.com slash hunter. Go to she's birdie spelled S-H-E-S-B-I-R-D-I-E dot com slash hunter for 15% off your first purchase. That's she'sbirdie.com slash hunter. All right, this is great. So what I hear you say is like, take advantage of some of the interests of the child, shorten that, shorten that instructional time. And my, I guess my question about, and then also like, let's, let's, let's take advantage of, we are on this technology. Like, let's make sure everyone really, really knows it and is really clear. You know, that's, that's essential. Let me, let me add one thing here, Hunter Mm -hmm. is listen, I think it's naive for anybody to think that even when we go back to quote unquote normal, that virtual learning is going to go away completely. Yeah, that's true. Right. And the use of the computers is just going to accelerate. The mesh of technology and live learning is just going to get stronger because it's convenient. I mean, you know what this is going to, there's a couple of problems it's going to solve. One is what if a kid's sick from school? Mm-hmm. I mean, not sick like COVID, like let's say two years from now, a kid has, I don't know, runny nose fever. Mm-hmm. You don't want to send them to school. They're out two days. Well, historically, what was their choice? They sit home, they do nothing. They get the homework from their friends. They're two days behind when they come back. If they're unlucky, they got a quiz or a test or a paper due, then now they got to cram for or make some kind of arrangement to catch up, right? Hmm. Well, now, guess what? We have a very easy solution. Live stream the class or semi-live stream the class, even if it's just a camera projecting it that the kid can watch, send the homework home virtually or have it in a shared file because now that everybody has availability to that, it, it definitely mitigates possibly even eliminates this whole idea of, of the big issue you have with sick days. Yeah. No, Especially I think when you have an extended, you know, I, I've had kids that work with concussions out of school two, three weeks or, you know, worse. And, and oh, yeah. it, it's, it, they miss like half years of school. It, it, there, there are some positives that can be harnessed here. If everybody's on the same page, developing things sort of in, in parallel with each other. And, and in the interests of the child, I, I mean, I definitely yes. agree with you. Like there's, yes. there's gotta be, benefits for to it but for the parents who what would you say so say the listener has a child who's like seven seven years old and you know the the school is not quite so savvy about what's really working for the kids and wants the Mm -hmm. kids to sit there for like a two-hour thing but you know this parent may be able to see like my seven-year-old needs to like run around the block like every 15 minutes because they're uh, you know, a human being in a body, yeah, <laughs> not just sure. a face on yeah. a screen. So no question. How, do you have any ideas for how people can communicate the needs of those kids or advocate, advocate for their kids? These, these like really real needs that we can see for the, the kids in, in these situations. This goes back a little bit to what I opened with was mm-hmm. the different perspectives, right? Mm-hmm. You got the students who got one perspective, you got the parents of another, you got the teachers with another One of the challenges of being a teacher is historically called classroom management, right? Mm -hmm. Which is not such a fancy term and is exactly what it sounds like. Managing your class, not letting kids talk, keeping everybody focused, uh, you know, dealing with any obstreperous behavior that comes up. Well, it's a whole nother animal online, right? You know what the biggest issue online is? Kids turning their camera off or kids clearly (laughs) doing other things, right? Like, like I'm supposed to be doing math with you and I'm like, I'm like hiding my phone so you can't see it. The teachers aren't dumb. They know what the kids are doing. The kids are chatting with each other. They're talking to other people. They're eating. So the whole world of classroom management has changed in this micro situation. I think like anything else to answer your question, it's a matter of communication, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong at this point because a six-year-old, eight-year-old is not going to advocate for themselves this way. But a parent just emailing a teacher and saying, listen, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Johnson, um, my kid just is not adapting well to this. I really need them to take a break about every 20 minutes, do something a little bit physical, get some energy burnt. It's fine with me. I am home. I'm, I'm in a virtual desk as well. And believe me, when they're on the screen, they're going to be engaged. 
One of the things I always tell parents, this is a little sidebar from really what we're talking about is um, I've worked with a lot of families who've had kids with uh, issues in school, not necessarily like emotional or anything, just they don't get along with teachers all the time. Mm -hmm. They argue about a grade or maybe there's a misunderstanding. And I always tell parents and students the same thing, which is when you, if you're going to go in and have any sort of confrontation or argument or discussion, dialogue, call it what you may, you'll get a hundred times further if you offer a solution. Mm -hmm. If you just go in and say, you're an idiot, you're the worst teacher I ever had, my kid hates you, I'm surprised you have a job, <laughs> some other nasty things I've been in rooms with parents accusing teachers about, you're not going to get very far. Everybody gets defensive, it gets ugly, it's not productive. But if you go in and say, listen, I know little Hunter here got a 52 on her math test, but she really tried and I really think she understood it. I think she just froze up on the test. Can we arrange to have her make up the test? And, you know, I get it. You want to be fair with grades. Maybe she just gets 80% credit on the second one. If you're reasonable, most teachers are going to say, you know what, that's fair. We just have to do it by Friday or, you know, whatever, make mm -hmm. a deadline. And everybody agrees. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the exact same mindset with this. We're, we're in, we're in a, a, an unusual situation. Everybody's got all kinds of stuff going on. I mean, I had a kid I was working with and they had a dog and the dog barked. I, I never saw a dog do this. The dog barked nonstop for 60 straight minutes. <laughs> loud it wasn't even like it was like and it was one of these annoying like high-pitched like chirpy oh, kind of no. dog bark it was like a terrier or something i'm gonna guess i didn't even saw the dog but i'm saying that like that's not the kid's fault who's supposed to be monitoring the dog while the kid's supposed to be learning i don't know is it a babysitter is it our parent I, I don't know whose job it was and i must have said four times the kid boy your dog's really loud like sort of a hint like you know can you go quiet the dog down or shut the door or something so these, you know, multiply that by 15, 20, 25, everybody, many kids are in a class and you've got all these potential things going on. Um, I think another way to answer your question is I'm a big fan of creativity, right? Of allowing children. I don't care if they're six, 15, 30, you know, 30 is not really a kid, but to be able to express their creativity. And my observation being a teacher and still being in education full-time is that creativity sometimes takes a backseat, except maybe in a creative writing class or maybe an English class. But in math, there's not a lot of creativity, not in history, not in science. And I think anytime you can bring anything into a learning situation that enables a child to be expressive. So instead of just writing a paper about something, maybe they build a model, maybe they get clay and they build something. Or, or if they're good at music, they make a song. Or if they're artistic, they can draw a picture or something. And little, little younger kids love this. It isn't until we get older that it's sort of bad to draw. I mean, you know, like you're told, well, what are you doing? You're wasting time. You know, pay attention, take notes. So I think there's ways that this could happen as well. So if you're learning something, you know, maybe you let the kid do something artistic or creative or mm -hmm. musical or whatever. So I think there are different outlets. Some are physical. Some are more uh, imaginatory or imaginative, but I think those are things that, that can be done as okay. well. I, I mean, I like the, you know, the way you talk about talking to a teacher is like kind of just saying, acknowledging like, these are the needs my child has, but also like acknowledging that you as a teacher might have these needs, right. For mm -hmm. everyone to be kind of focused and attentive and here's a, a way we can meet everybody's needs, like in the same yes. situation, just trying to be productive that way and saying like, let's, let's figure out a solution to, to meet everybody's needs. And so, so yeah. So dear listener, if you're hearing what Stephen's saying and you're like, I want that, well, ask for it, you know, talk yeah. to your teacher. Like they're reasonable people. They're trying to figure this stuff out too. So they may be trying to fit like a, an old, you know, a situation that works better in person into an online situation and not quite be as flex, you know, they may not realize yet what the kids are needing on the other side. So yeah, be your, be your kid's advocate and, and, and talk about those things. I love what you're saying about those like creative solutions in my kids classroom. They often have the choice of like a PowerPoint presentation, a story, or a drawing or like a sculpture to, to, mm -hmm. to do a project on something. And like, they've been making all these PowerPoint presentations. And actually my, my older daughter, when she was in seventh grade, she got to make a podcast as uh, to do a project on. And she mm -hmm. did a, a podcast 
which I thought yeah, was great. I, I mean, she wouldn't it, take any advice from me on that one, how to do a podcast. Why, why should she? She's she your child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you something um, interesting, I believe anyway, is, is clearly education as it sits in our present time is much different than it was even 10 years ago. The deliverability, the internet has changed so many things. Just the way kids research, right? Who goes to a library? Who even opens a book? I mean, which is kind of sad, but for thousands of years, education was more or less the same. And, and you know, I, I, I actually in graduate school had a class that traced the whole etiology of education. Our educational system in the United States, not surprisingly, traces back to England, mm-hmm. right? Because we were an English colony, right? Well, where did the English education system come from? Europe. Where did that come from? Rome. Where'd that come from? Greece. When you're talking 5,000 years here, it hasn't really changed that much, which is basically the model that the teacher has the information, the Socratic method, and is projecting that information to the students, right? Mm-hmm. So the idea of like child-centered education or student-driven education or the kids kind of making up their own curriculum is a relatively new idea. But it's fueled now because there's so many other ways kids can get the information. It's the teacher is no longer the only expert in the ma- subject matter because you've got online videos, you've got websites, you've got so many other places that this information can be called from. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, you still need some kind of authority, I guess, in the situation, but, but it, it's, it's really a huge paradigm shift in just education period. Oh, yeah. And, and it, it, I think the older the grade level, the more pronounced this gets because you start to get such a split of kids' abilities, right? I mean, roughly speaking, first, second, third graders are fairly close on ability level. You're always going to get some precocious ones and some that are a little bit behind the curve. But it, it gets much, much broader as kids get older. You know, by so, 10th, 11th grade, there's a huge disparity, sometimes grade level, multiple grade level differences in kids' abilities. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's let's imagine that we are getting into the older kids. Like you have you know, like kid, my child's age. Like you have a seventh grade, right? <laughs> seventh, seventh grade. So it's 13 or 12? Or no, right? uh, seventh, sixth, seventh grade, like middle school mm-hmm. or even fifth, fifth, sixth and seventh grade. They know how to learn. They've done school for a while, but they're, you know, they're home, they're remote learning and they're just, I, I don't know, I guess, how can we support the kids to engage with it, you know, and to, to keep that, that interest and to, you know, I mean, I guess that the thing that I'm worried about most is like, I'm not, I don't care so much about her learning all the vocabulary words for fifth grade or, or um, getting to the, the, a certain math level in fifth grade. What I'm really worried about most is like her hating school because of remote learning. So I don't know. I don't know what the answer is to that. I I don't know what the question is. At least in part, is you have to keep them challenged. You got to push the envelope a little bit. I mean, just because it's remote doesn't mean what would work in regular school would doesn't work. Mm-hmm. It's just a different delivery, right? So I, I don't think there's any need to completely throw out the things that could be successful modes in school, in classroom setting, just because it's remote. I think it's, it's, an, it's a consideration more of adapting and sort of saying, well, we need to do more of this, less of this. Mm -hmm. So clearly I've observed this, (laughs) didn't take me long to see this. The lecture model doesn't work, especially for an older kid, does not work well remotely. In a classroom setting, a teacher can probably get away with more or less lecturing for 35 or 40 minute class. And the kids, because they're basically good kids and they're not going to act out, are basically just going to sit there and deal with it. That is very, that, doesn't work well in a remote situation. Oh, There's God, too no. many things to distract the kid. Yes. They, they're not interested that much anyway. At least in school, they can look at their friends. They can kind of like, you know, I don't know, whatever, pass notes, whatever they're going to do sort of innocently. So you got to acknowledge that some things are going to work well and some won't. On the other hand, it, it would be considered comparably poor teaching for a teacher to walk into a classroom and say, hey, for the next three days, we're just going to work on a project. I'm going to sit at my desk and read the newspaper. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and t- parents would say, well, what's the teacher getting paid for for doing that, right? Mm-hmm. 
So, but on a remote situation, that's a good idea. But, but you're never going to do both for 100% of a class period. So I think what this, I think the answer, which is certainly not a black and white absolute answer here is you got to do more of what works well in the remote setting. And sometimes that's trial and error. Mm-hmm. You got to do less of what doesn't work well. And then I think the third piece of that triangle a little bit is trying to give the kids some, in, and I talked about this before, is give the kids some time individually to just pursue something that they personally like or they personally find interesting, even if it has nothing to do with the curriculum, right? Even if it's just, hey, you know, we're going to take a half, 10 minutes a day and you can just work on an individual project. And at the end of two weeks, everybody's going to do a little presentation to class about what they did. It does some level of accountability mm-hmm. or else the kids won't do anything or they'll, you know, do it the day before. Um, but I, I think that's part of it. And I think the other piece of this is, you know what was one of the things that's hard to do, but in class is, okay, hey, okay, guys, it's math time. All right, you know, Danny, Alice, Bill, Charlie, Alyssa, and Frank, go up to the board and you guys do one, two, three, or five, six. You know, and you got this, you know, this old school, right? You got kids that chalk and they're all writing on the board trying to do the math problems. Everybody else, will, rah, rah. okay, did they get it right? Did your answer the same? That you can't really do that remotely, right? But you can have kids, if you break out rooms, right? Like in Zoom or, you know, teams, you can break out into groups. So you say, okay, here's an idea. Why don't we break everybody out into groups of four, for example? And you're just going to do, you got four math problems. Group one has one, two, three, four. This group has five, six, seven, eight. Each one of you take one problem and show everybody else how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So they're teaching each other. And that's the best way to learn anything is to teach someone else how to do it. So there's you, you're what you're describing really is like engagement, you know, like yes. where the teacher is less like a lecturer, less a deliverer of information and more of a coach, you know, like here we're all together learning this thing. What are the best ways that we can get people engaged in learning mm-hmm. this together? And so that's really what we need to. So maybe, maybe dear listener, the best bet is to just say, dear <laughs> teacher, please listen to this episode yes, of so really, well, podcast with Stephen Green. Well, they, they, yes, they obviously, <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, and I'm not saying this because I, I want to be clear about this. I'm not saying any teacher isn't trying to do the best they can. Oh, no. It's I just so think hard. that the reality is that there are things that work great in a normal setting that don't work well in remote and vice versa. And I think we th- there's just a need to acknowledge that and better yet, take advantage of it. And some people, forget teachers, are stubborn. I've been doing it this way for 32 years. Why should I be changing now? Nobody's going to tell me how to do this anymore. I mean, you get that on both sides uh, uh, and every side. Um, but I think that's really the secret. And the, the schools and the people, the teachers and the circumstances I've worked with, where I've been able to give them some of these ideas, the feedback's almost always very positive. Um, because frankly, it just works better. You know, it, it's, it's, it's accomplishing the goal, which is to learn something. It's also accomplishing a goal of keeping kids engaged, which is difficult. And, and knowing that they're being engaged and not just staring out the window and acting like they're engaged. And also it, it creates long-term. There's one thing we didn't talk about, which is in education, you have short-term objectives and you have long-term objectives, right? So it's like, okay, guys and girls, today we're going to learn how to multiply three times four. Okay, short-term objective. Well, we got long-term objectives because later we want to try to multiply 32 by 45 or something. So you have foundational skills, usually a short-term objective, that's now going to be bundled into a longer-term objective. Um, You don't usually use this uh, vocabulary or jargon when you're actually teaching a student. You don't describe it this way, but this is pretty much how it works. And I think that's stuff that you you, you want to build into these lessons as well. And you could do them in parallel. I mean, these are things, I mean, I guessing you didn't go to school to become a teacher <laughs> but frankly you know i did and and a lot of the classes actually are... <laughs> i have a master's in art education oh there you go right. so there you I, go i, I did <laughs> I, well, I forget though <laughs> well but i mean you know like they i i went i sat through classes in college and in graduate school that had titles like um you know um objective planning mm. it's like what does that mean so you spend 13 i don't know how many hours but 40 hours learning how to basically set a goal that you want kids to learn like it's not that complicated 
But there's so many layers to it sometimes. There's so many different ways you can overlap them and intertwine them. They can get a little complicated if you don't plan it out right. And that's the other piece is everything we're talking about requires some level of planning. By the teacher, by the students a little bit, somebody has to drive this. And you can't say, well, I'm going to worry about what we're doing Monday on Monday and I'm going to worry about Tuesday, Tuesday. This needs to be like, I got a four, a week long plan and Monday fits into the rest of it. And I got a monthly plan. This is how week one fits into the four weeks, things like this. And again, I'm not suggesting people aren't doing this, but I think it's even more important when, when you, there's a, a little less certainty that the message is getting across, perhaps. I think the last thing I would say is if we flash forward to the older grades, mm -hmm. which is potentially the most complicated part of this discussion or mm -hmm. the most simple, I think there you've got the advanced students, most of them you, you can almost just let do what they want to do because they're motivated, they've got the skills, they, they really don't need a, a strong instructional presence. It's the kids who aren't strong students that are really getting lost. And I see this a lot in my private practice where the kids are just, they're behind anyway, they can't keep up, they just get further and further disenfranchised from what's going on. They eventually say, whatever, um, I didn't like this anyway, or I don't care if I get a D, you know, that sort of thing. Um, there's no chance for a teacher to physically walk around the room and say, hey, you know, are you okay? Or, you know, stuff like that. So they've lost that kind of personal thing as well. That, that's the people I, I worry about at that age level. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. We are supported by Green Chef, which is the first USDA certified organic meal kit company so you can enjoy clean ingredients you can trust seasonally sourced for peak freshness my favorite green chef meal it was so good is barramundi with chimichurri and barramundi is this amazing sustainably sourced fish and it came with sauteed zucchini and red bell pepper and this incredible yummy chimichurri sauce because i don't know if you've had chimichurri but it's so good and i have not been able to make it myself and it's so delicious i loved it the food was honestly really amazing the ingredients come pre-measured perfectly proportioned and mostly prepped so you can spend less time stressing and more time eating delicious home cooked meals and they make it easy and affordable with plans that fit every lifestyle so you could be keto paleo vegan or vegetarian or just basically looking to eat healthier or have an easy meal service that's organic right and there's a whole range to suit any diet or preference Green Chef is the first ever keto meal kit on the market. It makes sticking to low carb lifestyle easy with recipes averaging only 14 net carbs each if you are in that keto world. And what I like about it is that they're really the most sustainable meal kit. Not only are they USDA certified organic, but they offset 100% of their direct carbon emissions and plastic packaging in every box. So you can feel really good about what you're eating and how it gets to your table. It's really important to me and my family that we eat sustainably sourced food, but it's exhausting in this pandemic cooking every single meal. We just get so tired of it. This really provides this refreshing boost where you get these new recipes, new ideas, and my 14-year-old, she can cook those meals herself. It really provides a great break in the week, which is why I love Green Chef. Go to greenchef.com slash 90hunter and use the code 90hunter to get 90 bucks off, including free shipping. That's greenchef.com slash number 90hunter, 90hunter, and use the code 90hunter, again, it's the numbers, 90hunter, to get $90 off, including free shipping. And how can we as parents support those kids? Like if you think, if we think like I have one of those kids who's getting lost in the system, who's not, who's struggling, mm -hmm. is not being seen, how can we support those kids? Step one's always awareness, but the kid's probably not frequently going to volunteer it. Because if no. you say how school, <laughs> it's fine. Fine. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, like my kids are in their twenties now. So I've been, I'm through the whole window of every potential level of being ignored. <laughs> 
Um, you know, so you're not going to have an in-depth conversation. So I think this is an advantage if you're home to just observe, you know, just, I mean, it won't be nosy, nosy, or, you know, I mean, privacy things, I guess, but you kind of just stand outside the kid's room and just listen to what's going on in school and see if the kid's actually doing anything. Because most of these things are insidious, right? They don't, it's not like one day a kid becomes a disinterested student. It, it's a slowly evolving, decaying uh, thing, unfortunately, where they, they lose a little bit of interest and they get a little bit behind. And because they're a little bit behind, they can't engage as much the next few days. And then the gap gets a little wider. And all of a sudden, three weeks later, they're like, ah, I got to work so hard to catch up. It's not even worth it to me. And I never liked the subject anyway. I'm never going to be an architect where I need to know math. You know, and, and they're, they, they, you know, how kids are, teenagers are, they, they take everything to the nth degree very quickly like that. Yes. Well, you may not even have a teenager, but you will know. know this, believe me. <laughs> no, I, uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I'm just saying, it, you know, this is just how it works. And it, it so the answer is, I think parents got to stay on top of it if they're concerned at all. And even if they're not, they should make it their business to be. Not, not hours a day, but you know, check in, you know, what's going on here? What are you learning? And, and just insist on more than a one word answer. I think also early intervention is big. And this is where you do want to be in touch with a teacher. Now, when a teacher's in school, they should see this because they'll see the kid drifting off. But this is why I worry about it remotely because I don't think it's harder to identify when these things are happening. So by the time it gets identified, the whole is deeper and wider. Mm -hmm. I'm, not I'm not talking about kids with learning disabilities yeah. or, you know, uh, spectrum based stuff. I'm just talking about a disinterested, bored student who'd rather be, you know, doing anything else than starting a computer learning class. It'll be really interesting to see what happens next year, assuming we're going back in person next yeah, year. Yeah, which I think Please is a let of it happen in, the, yeah. in September. But um, it'll it'll be really interesting to see what happens next year as far as like it'll be a, a year like no other because of this this whole break in the middle. But yeah, I see what, I hear what you're saying. Like we need to if you're worried about your kid, like you got to kind of stay on top of them. And and I so I was in that situation like with my youngest daughter and she didn't want to she wanted to do her work on a laptop in the corner of the corner couch. So nobody could see what was happening, right? So mm -hmm. then she would kind of drift off and be looking at like fish tank stuff on Pinterest. <laughs> and you know, she'd be doing her own research on like fish stuff, but she wasn't really engaged and, and you know, all these things happen. But yeah, there's a level of insistence of like, okay, well, if you're, you know, I got, then I guess I'll have to email your teacher and ask if you can't tell me what's going on or show me what's going on. We want to see the the plan and all of that. And we can do that kindly, you know, like it's, oh, yeah, it, yeah, it's, well. it's, it can be feel shameful and embarrassing for a kid to be not on top of things. Right. So we have to just remember that take into account those feelings. We don't want to be adding layers of like shame and blame and hurt to a mm -hmm. situation that may already be hurtful, but to that's our job, right? Is to kind of like say, okay, what is going on for you? Like be interested, be curious and be well, that. I, I think, I think the theme here is not that you want to foster any contentious relationship with your child, but I think the, the, the spirit is that in this circumstance, I think the, uh, the likelihood of a, a child who would maybe or maybe not become out of it in school, whatever that means, um, is greater to happen and to happen more quickly. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you'd want to put the brakes on it as soon as you can. It's interesting because like kind of the advice we're saying is like if you have a kindergarten, first grader, even second grader, like let's lighten up and let's like yeah. have it be more play-based, more interest-based, things like that. But then we're saying on the other side of that, mm -hmm. let's not fall behind. Um, well, but you're talking, I mean, messages? the difference between a 10th mm -hmm. or 11th grader and a first grader mm -hmm. academically is is two completely different conversations. But um, I, because I think we're working on the assumption that by the time a kid's in 10th or 11th grade, they, they ought to be at least able to work independently. Yeah, yeah. They may not be given the opportunity to constantly, but they should be able to. 
So, and, and I think that's just, that's just goes along with teaching in high school. I mean, that's, and being a high school student. So, um, so you know, the that, ages were kind of looking at like kind of being more concerned and more involved. What would you say they are as we start to kind of look at this? You know, we're, we're, we're letting ourselves chill and relax the parents of the younger of younger kids and, and mm-hmm. make things more fun and interesting. Right. Because we want to yes. keep that spark of learning. What at what ages are we starting to say, OK, let's get more involved, get more concerned? I think you'd want to start to keep an eye on it in middle school, but without a a really tight window Um, because there's still time, right? Because look, from a lot of kids, I don't know what percent, but the vast majority of high school kids going into high school are their basic goal is to get out of high school and go to college. Okay. To, to, I mean, for the most part, that's basically what our system has grown into there's obviously other options, but so by the time they're in 10th or 11th grade, especially the end of 11th grade, a lot of that story has been written. They've got their grades. That's going to be their transcript. They're going to start doing applications in any year. This year's wacky, but it's still what it is. So if you drop the ball on your grades in 9th, 10th, 11th grade has a much bigger impact on your life than it would have any other grades up until that point. Ninth grade is always a little bit of a slippery slope because it's a transition year Typically, you're moving from middle school building to a high school building. You're now the youngest kids in the building. They're the oldest ones in the old building. There are a few eight and seven, eight, nine high schools or uh, junior highs. But so th- there's a socialization that happens in ninth grade. That's, I think sometimes you have to give a little bit to. But certainly by mid eight, late ninth grade, and certainly into 10th grade, I think this is where the, the, the potential um, downside of poor performance really can can put a kid back. And of course, in the moment, kids aren't thinking long-term. Mm-hmm. Kids not sitting there in the middle of 10th grade, go, oh, if I get a D on this test, it's, you know, I'm not going to get in a pen or whatever. Um, but, but frankly, it's, a, it's the pattern of that thought process that's going to get them in, into, into the wrong you know, way things are going to work out. And by the time it's done, two, a year and a half later, it's too late. And I'm definitely not sitting here saying every parent should be on top of their kid every single day, making sure that they're incredibly perfect students. I'm just saying that th- because the monitoring that normally would happen in a classroom isn't really happening remotely, it's sort of by default incumbent on somebody else to do it. I think most parents are saying, well, my kid's old enough. They, they get it. They're this, they're that. I don't need to babysit a 16, 17 year old. That's probably should be true but there is a fraction of that population that really isn't capable of working as independently. And, and, and comparatively speaking, I think they're the ones that are taking a little bit of a bigger hit in terms of academic performance and maybe opportunities down the road. And I think that's where the parents want to be aware of what's going on. Okay. So that's where we want to, we want to step in. We want to be a helper. We want to be a support. We don't want to be, not a fight. Like a heavy, no. a heavy hand no. here. We don't want to fight. We want to be a helper. We want to be support. We want to support them. The, the word, the, I th- the, the fancy word, be an advocate. An advocate, yes. Yeah, advocate. How about Beautiful. that? Fancy word. But that, but that's really what you want. You, the parents should be advocating for their child's success. The kids don't always appreciate <laughs> that you're advocating for their success, but that's really what you're doing. And part of that is, you know, there's a tough love aspect to it, right? And there's a, a, a practical piece to it. And there's, there's a piece to it where you're trying to foster a, a, a teenager becoming an adult behaviorally and responsibility wise. And that's part of what school is, you know, essentially it's 16, 17, year old, that's their job. Some kids have jobs, but their main goal is to do as well as they can in school. Yeah. Parents job is to give them the environment to do it. Yeah. Which it's another episode. We talked about that last fall, dear yes. listener. <laughs> yeah, we got it. That's, the structure piece is a big, big piece right now. We didn't get into that at all. And I could talk about that for about two hours, but we won't today. <laughs> the structure piece. Well, we did We did do an episode on that with uh, Kimberlyn Lavelle, and that was in the fall. I don't have the uh, episode number off the top of my head, dear listener. I'm sorry, but, but go ahead and check back into that as far as structuring your home for remote learning and doing better mm-hmm. with that. Um, Stephen, 
this has been really helpful. I think a way of just kind of thinking, stepping back from this remote learning thing and kind of just thinking about it a little bit more clearly and objectively has certainly been helpful for me. Um, I really appreciate your, what you're, uh, what you're offering here. Um, what, if people want to learn more about, um, what you're doing, um, and, uh, and making the grade and where can they find you? Easiest thing is probably just to go to the website, which is makethegrade.net, M-A-K-E-T-H-E-G-R-A-D-E.net. Um, there's all sorts of stuff on there, and there's a contact form where they can get a hold of me. The, my email is sgreen, S-G-R-E-E-N-E, at makethegrade.net. I'm, I'm, I'm not the world's greatest social media diva, <laughs> but I am on all of them somewhere, most of them at Make the Grade or at me. Um, but, but typically it starts with an email. I have a lot of people reaching out with the biggest thing I see are people asking me if what they perceive to be a small problem is something they should really worry about becoming a larger problem. That's I getting a lot of that. You know, mm -hmm. my kid's doing this, should I be worried? Mm -hmm. And I'm not a psychologist, you know, I'm not a behavioral expert. I look at this as an academic. Um, but I do know it's much easier to solve small problems than big ones. And that's, I think, where preparation and, and sticking with systems and understanding where you're at compared to you want to be goal setting is really important. Okay. And, um, and any final words for the parents or, who are muddling through this as imperfectly as we are? I, 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 oh, I, I mean, you could take so many views on that, but I think I, I'm going to go with this. I think I try to look at everything as an opportunity. Okay. So I think this is an opportunity to get out of the box a little bit, learn some new skills, maybe build relationships with your kids that you might not have otherwise, especially if you're working at home and essentially being a, a hall monitor, <laughs> whatever principal to your child. Um, and I think you just have to accept that this is what it is. You know, there's no point screaming and yelling about it and, complaining and why isn't this and why isn't that and it, it, you know it, it's out of our control to a degree so I, I would like to say try to think of this as a learning experience and um, like like for ourselves as well and and use that to, to build strength in other skills that maybe you didn't have or didn't think about getting in the past so thank you I'll leave it at that Okay. Thank you so much, Stephen. I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you got something out of this episode and it was helpful. If it was, of course, please share it with friends. Take a screenshot of you listening to it. Let me know what your takeaways were, what you're going to do differently, what you're not going to do. Maybe you're not going to worry so much about your younger kids. I hope so. And we have a lot of great episodes coming up for you. I mean, amazing conversations and next week. We are going to be talking about how to communicate more skillfully with your kids. Another great one. And something super cool, by the way, this episode is the first episode that we are going to be releasing the video of on my YouTube channel at mindfulmamamentor.com. We'll put it under the podcast link and we will put that YouTube channel in there under this episode. And there's also a bunch of great resources there. So I have a book tab where you can get all special bonuses for when you buy Raising Good Humans in, you know, paperback or in hardcover, I think is coming out and or an audiobook. You can learn more about joining the Mindful Parenting membership. And I also have a bunch of other resources on there. I have some free meditations. I have a mindfulness for moms guide. So you can learn more about that. And you can even learn more about the teacher certification program that I'm doing. I even have some yoga practices from way back when you can practice 18 minutes of flow yoga with me in my spring garden. <laughs> so check it out. That's all at mindfulmamamentor.com. Finally, I just want to say thank you. I feel really grateful for this connection that we have through talking. I, you know, you, dear listener, I feel really honored that you are sharing your time with me and spending your time with me. You know, I want to live 
up to that all the time. I always think about the quality of this podcast and I want to show up really honestly very authentically for you and to be real for you and to provide you resources that you find valuable and to just, you know, open up this conversation, to add to this conversation, to to add to this revolution. So I'm really grateful for you and your time. And um, I'm really honored that you share it with me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I wish you a beautiful, peaceful week with some joys and some rest and all the good things. See you next week. Namaste. I say definitely do it. It's really helpful. It will change your relationship with your kids for the better. It will help you communicate better. And just, I'd say communicate better as a person, as a wife, as a spouse. It's been really a positive influence in our lives. So definitely do it. I'd say definitely do it. It's so worth it. The money really is inconsequential when you get so much benefit from being a better parent to your children and feeling like you're connecting more with them and not feeling like you're yelling all the time or you're like, why isn't things working? I would say definitely do it. It's so, so worth it. It'll change you. No matter what age someone's child is, it's a great opportunity for personal growth and it's a great investment in someone's family. I'm very thankful I have this. You can continue in your old habits that aren't working or you can learn some new tools and gain some perspective to shift everything in your parenting. Are you frustrated by parenting? Do you listen to the experts and try all the tips and strategies, but you're just not seeing the results that you want? Or are you lost as to where to start? Does it all seem so overwhelming with too much to learn? Are you yearning for a community of people who get it, who also don't want to threaten and punish to create cooperation? Hi, I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and if you answered yes to any of these questions, I want you to seriously consider the Mindful Parenting membership. You'll be joining hundreds of members who have discovered the path of mindful parenting and now have confidence and clarity in their parenting. This isn't just another parenting class. This is an opportunity to really discover your unique, lasting relationship, not only with your children, but with yourself. It will translate into lasting, connected relationships, not only with your children, but your partner too. Let me change your life. Go to mindfulparentingcourse.com to add your name to the wait list so you will be the first to be notified when I open the membership for enrollment. I look forward to seeing you on the inside. mindfulparentingcourse.com